today we're going to be looking at the politics of the Gilded Age, specifically 1866 to 1896, and looking at how the politics of the era in many ways reflected all the other issues that were going on with urbanization and the technological transformations, meaning that on some level, it seemed like everything was running very smoothly. And then in other ways, if you scratch beneath the surface, as Mark Twain always said, you should when looking at this Gilded Age, you saw that there was a lot of corruption and things that were problematic. And so we want to look at those and then the beginnings of how they begin to be solved um, at the end of the 19th century. So three things we want to think about as we begin this is one, what were ways in which the federal government was evolved in the economy between 1793 and 1865? If what's coming to mind are things like, oh, there was an excise tax. Um, there was a period of time where there was a national bank. Um, there was um, the printing of monies, what becomes that national currency, the greenback, um, during the time of the um, Civil War. We see also there are tariffs throughout this period. Um, but ultimately, that's what's going to drive the economy. Even the American system, where supposedly there were these tariffs that were being used in order to build infrastructure, um, it's very limited in the ways in which the federal government is directly involved in the economy, meaning that it's putting money in, taking money out, and is able to help when there are problems in the market. Um, we saw panics in 1819, 1837. Um, we'll see several after the Civil War. So the role that the government has today in the economy, very different than it was in the first part of our country's history. Um, three ways in which the national government brings in revenue. Well, certainly tariffs, um, taxes of various sorts. So prior to the 16th Amendment, we didn't really have national income tax. The couple of times that the national government attempted to employ that. Um, the Supreme Court came in and said it was unconstitutional. So it actually took an amendment to make it possible for the national government to tax incomes. And that won't happen until 1912. We'll also see the national government bringing in revenue by selling land. They'll do that throughout our nation's history. But again, there are limitations in what the national government can do. Certainly, um, in the period we're looking at today. And then three expenditures of national government. So what does the national government spend its money on? Well, the army and the navy. Um, we'll see in the period that is the American system, there was a little bit of expenditure for things like canals um, and roads, but very little at a national level. Certainly the Transcontinental Railroad, a lot of the, the seed money, certainly the reimbursement system for the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific was a national government expenditure in this time period. What will become the reservation system? throughout the 19th century. Um, it was a very small one, but it also was an expenditure of the national government at the time. Today, we look at expenditures of the national government for things like social security and health care. Um, and obviously, these were things that were not part of um, the early economy of the United States. So the national party system, the two party system that comes out of the mid 1850s, Democrats versus Republicans, that third party system continues on into this time period and obviously to this day. What you notice though is that ultimately we have a stalemate, meaning that for the most part, it's pretty equal in terms of the number of people who are voting Democrat and where they vote Democrat in this country, um, and the number of people who vote Republican, that these states continue to have essentially voting blocks, and they continue to vote in the same manner again and again. So as a candidate, it's very hard to sway the population, especially at the national level, um, to vote for you if you are not of the party that the state is traditionally voting for. So unfortunately, this is actually going to encourage some corruption, and corruption may be part of the reason why we have the stalemate in this time period. 
Also a characterization of this time period is intense voter loyalty. And you can see that in the graphic before this one, where at least in 1876, 1880, if you were a Democrat, 80% of the time you are voting for Democrats and same thing for Republicans. Um, we'll see a little shifting of that um, starting in 1892, but then it'll bounce back four years later to much greater loyalty. Um, 1892, 1893 um, were years of um, economic turmoil. Um, we'll see also a huge drop um, starting in the early 1900s, um, getting closer and closer to the level that we see today, where about half the population is very much rooted supporting one candidate for one party versus another. But the other 50% of the population, well, they're up for grabs. That just didn't exist in an earlier time period. So there were voting blocks, and one might argue that there still are today, but they're definitely comprised of different groups of people. So the Democratic voting bloc of the late 19th century was white Southerners. If you think about it this way, Lincoln was the party, uh, the Republican Party, right? He essentially was their father, their first candidate for national office. And so as a reaction to that, Southern Democrats out of the outcome of the Civil War, we're not going to vote for Republicans. Um, Roman Catholics, who tended to be from the immigrant groups, particularly Irish immigrants um, coming into major cities, um, the first people they encountered who welcomed them and provided some quasi-social services, as you saw with your Boss Tweed presentation from the last class, well, it was the political machines and the democratic political machines, especially those in Boston, New York, and Chicago of the day. Again, other groups um, of recent immigrants, um, you'll see a lot of Jews who will come to the United States between 1890 and the early 1900s. Again, who's welcoming them? Who's providing some social services? It's going to be these democratic political machines. There's also urban working poor, and sometimes these people are directly tied to the political machines. Um, often they are also people who are part of the labor movement. Um, unions were not popular with laissez-faire capitalists, and that certainly was one of the economic principles of the Republican Party of that day. And so that is also why. Essentially, if you want to look at it this way, the Democratic voting bloc becomes basically a reactionary voting bloc to what is the platform of the Republican Party. We're also going to see out in the West over time, more and more farmers will be voting Democrat. Again, because they are going to be reacting to what they see as the group that the Republican Party is most likely to support, which are the industrialists and in particular, those who own the railroads. So the Republican voting bloc, that's going to be pro-business Northerners who are white. It's going to be African Americans where they can vote. And obviously, overwhelmingly in the American South, African Americans are going to be disenfranchised in the late 19th century. Northern Protestants, um, what becomes known as the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, um, people who are not part of this immigrant trend that has been happening after um, the formation of the United States, but people who see their ancestors um, coming from an earlier period, that early colonial period of time in particular. Um, anybody who is anti-immigrant is going to find, essentially the old nativists um, are going to find a lot of support in that Republican voting bloc as well. Um, that is going to be a group that is going to call for um, limits on immigration at a time when there doesn't seem to be much, if any. Um, and then obviously people of the middle class. So if I have become someone who is accumulating assets, I'm accumulating some wealth, um, I'm working for a salary versus a wage. Um, what are the values of the time period in terms of thrift, hard work, education, sobriety? Well, those are going to be the classic values of the middle class of that time. 
again, this is based out of the Republican Party platform um, that begins um, in the late 1850s, where we see the Democratic voting bloc, at least until the beginning of the 20th century, is very much a reaction to this platform and these people. Um, and certainly one of the big issues that people are going to discuss of the day, and certainly they do today, is naturalization of immigrant peoples and what impact that might have. Um, for many Republicans, especially those that did not control the local politics in urban centers like New York in particular because of Ellis Island and the number of recent arrivals that came to that particular city, but also Boston and Chicago of the day, they saw that ultimately you had Democrats um, attempting to use these groups of people for their own political gain. And certainly there is some truth to that, but those people would have been available to whomever was willing to support them. Um, they just found typically it was local democratic populations that were offering them that assistance early on. So the government itself is very much hands off in the economy, right? Laissez faire, free market. And so most people's expectation was that the government doesn't actually intervene in the economy and it doesn't intervene or in any way attempt to regulate um, people's safety or standard of living. Obviously, after 1900, what becomes the progressive era, we're going to see some very different trends that carry on to this day. But in the height of the Gilded Age, we see the government doing very little domestically. The expectation was you delivered the mail, that you provided for the national defense, that there were taxes and tariffs that were collected, and those were the sole monies of the government. Um, and the government could also sell land. But beyond that, um, the national government should work on a limited budget. Um, and certainly it was conducting the foreign policy of the day. Its biggest expenditure um, of the late 19th century is going to be the pension system that comes out of the Civil War. For all of those who survived the war um, and widows and children of soldiers who died, they were all awarded a pension. And paying out of that pension was probably one of the largest expenditures um, until the beginning of the 20th century. The presidency itself is very much a symbolic office. If the party that wins it now has jobs that it can hand out. This is a continuation of the spoils system that Andrew Jackson began in the late 1820s. And the president himself is th thought of as head of the party today, but ultimately there was a party boss. Whoever was the head of the Democratic Party, the head of the Republican Party, ultimately was shaping who was going to be the party's candidate for president. And often you wanted to pick someone who could play out to a much larger audience. So even if they were a governor, that their values, uh, what they stand for might only apply to people within that state. So you were looking for someone who would have a pedigree, a resume that would make them you know, a possibility to a much larger audience, but ultimately the president himself had relatively little power. It's going to be whoever is running the party who's gonna make those decisions. States at that time still were not picking, you know, by any kind of direct vote, their candidates for president. We don't have presidential primaries like we do today. That's really um, a facet of the 20th century. So for the Republican Party, which was the party that was in power for most of the 19th century, um, from 1860 to 1912, we will have one Democratic president who will serve two terms, but not consecutively. That'll be Grover Cleveland. Everyone else will be a Republican. And in certainly up until the 1890s, the head of the Republican Party was a man named Roscoe Conklin, who was a Republican senator from New York. And ultimately, his goal was to always pick a candidate that was going to win because there were literally tens of thousands of jobs at stake. Um, in 1865, about 53,000 people worked for the federal government. And again, these are all spoil system jobs. Um, by 1890, it's 160,000. 
So a significant amount of patronage um, to be handed out. And this is actually going to split the Republican Party. Um, you'll have people who believe that patronage is essential in the same way that the Democrats utilized it in the first half of the 19th century. Um, we have what are called the stalwarts. And these are people who the, the word stalwart itself means one who is committed um, in in all of their um, being to a cause. And the stalwarts believe that the Republican Party would only continue to have power if they could win these elections. It's why you see the horrific brokering of the election of 1876 in which Rutherford B. Hayes wins. Um, he was a stalwart. Um, and for the presidential candidates to come, this is gonna continue to be an issue. There were Republicans, however, who were concerned about the ever increasing levels of corruption because of the system. And they became known as half breeds, um, which is a, a term that we would not use today because it has all kinds of ethnic and racist overtones. But the half breeds were individuals who said, you know, I think the Republican Party itself has um, a platform that serves the people of the country best, that we, through picking decent candidates, can win elections, that we don't need to hand out jobs, political favors to win, and that ultimately this is only going to continue to cause more and more corruption. So there was between these two factions, an ever increasing debate on who would be the candidate. So the National Nominating Committee literally met in a city, often Chicago, um, after 1864, and they would spend days brokering with one another who would be their candidate. Sometimes they would have to vote multiple times in order to agree on a presidential candidate. In 1880, their compromise was for a man named James A. Garfield, who was certainly a half-breed. He was someone who felt that there was a lot of corruption and that one of the things that needed to happen over time was moving away from this patronage system. This was a compromise because the other candidate that the stalwarts wanted was a man named Chester A. Arthur, who also um, was a member of Congress from New York. And Chester A. Arthur was the poster child of patronage. Um, he had continued to win elected office by utilizing this system, um, at least at the state level. But James Garfield and Chester A. Arthur were very different figures. Garfield himself had grown up poor. Um, his father had died at an early age. Um, he had been basically self-educated. He managed to work and raise some money to go to college. By the time he was 24, he had a PhD and was actually running the college that he had attended. Um, he went on to fight in the Civil War, rose to the rank of general, um, fought at Gettysburg. Um, and after the war, he continued to do good for the people of Ohio, um, not only in education, but then he ran for governor. And he was a person who was well-liked and he actually fit the resume that the Republican Party liked. If we talk about this idea of waving the bloody shirt, which is this idea that you have someone who has a military record from the most recent um, war, well, he had that. And he was an educated man and a man who was seen as somebody who had helped the public um, in terms of education and being an elected official. So in the 1880 election, the Republicans win by a landslide. Again, the states they win are predominantly those of the North. Um, even those that go westward are still above what would have been historically that Missouri Compromise line. You can see that the South is solidly entrenched in its support for Democrats of that day. Garfield wasn't president very long. Actually, from the time he was inaugurated to the day he died, less than five months. But his election and his death will ultimately be the reason why the patronage system goes away. So in the spring of 1881, um, James Garfield decided that he was going to join his family for their summer trip to the Jersey Shore. He was going to take a train from Union Station in Washington, D.C. And even after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, 
the president typically walked around Washington, D.C. Um, with little to no protection. On the day that he was shot, he was walking just with a few members of his cabinet, including a man named Robert Lincoln, who was Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's son. He gets to the train station and a gentleman approaches him named Charles Gitto and shoots him. But he does not die. He actually survives the initial attack. He's taken to the White House and it will actually be his subsequent lack of proper medical care that will lead to his death. But how could the shooting of a president and his assassination several months later get rid of the patronage system? Well, it's actually in the figure of Charles Gateau. He shoots the president. He thinks he's killed him. And he shouts to all the people who are at the station that day, I am a stalwart and Arthur is president now. And for people who heard that, they were like, oh, he's a stalwart Republican. He's someone involved in patronage. And he's celebrating the fact that he thinks he's killed the sitting president and the vice president, who is also a stalwart and likes patronage, is now going to take office. Charles Gateau's story is one in which he was a person who had written um, a essentially a manifesto, um, extolling the values of Garfield and why he should be uh, president of the United States. Um, he had been someone who'd had a series of jobs, but never ever held one steadily, got engaged at one point in his 20s, um, but his fiance broke it off. He had kind of fallen afoul of his mother and decided that he was just gonna devote himself to politics. So Garfield wins in 1881, and because of his written support, he goes off to DC in order to get his patronage position. He had published in his mind a piece of writing that encouraged many, particularly in the area of Indiana and Illinois, to vote for Garfield. He gets to the White House in April of 1881, and he says he's there to get his job. And it was so common for the various leaders of the parties within these states to just give a list to the new president saying, these are all the people who are owed jobs. These people are owed jobs that pay really well. And these people, maybe their position is going to be something that's part-time or more honorary. But ultimately, these are the jobs that have to be doled out. Charles Gateau's name was not on any of these lists, but it is possible that he might be someone who had done something that might have been important to the victory that Garfield had. So day after day, Charles Gateau would show up at the White House. And yes, in those days, you could knock on the front door of the White House, not have an appointment, say you wanted to see the president if he had time and you were allowed to wait. And Charles Gateau did this day after day. And every day at reception, they would take his name and people would be asking people, sending telegrams, trying to figure out who he was. And after more than a month, it was decided that Charles Gateau might have supported Garfield. He might have even published something in a newspaper. But he had not been instrumental in Garfield's victory. And he was not owed a job by anybody. And Charles Gateau was asked to leave. He believed that the next step that he needed to take, the proper course of action, was to make sure that someone else was president. So he pawned what possessions he had, he took the money, and he bought a gun. And he hunted down the president. He followed him out of the White House on that spring day in 1881 and shot him. And once he was arrested, it was weeks and weeks and weeks before anyone realized that Charles Gateau simply was mentally ill. He was schizophrenic. He had imagined all of this. And he had killed an innocent man. As each day went on, Chester A. Arthur was holed up in a, an apartment in New York City um, because part of the country was convinced he was involved in some sort of conspiracy to take over the presidency. Um, he himself was concerned about who Charles Gateau was, that perhaps he was someone who had been dismissed but was actually owned a political favor. But in actual fact, he was just mentally ill. But he was so convincing of his belief that the journalists, the public as a whole, believed that Chester A. Arthur must have done something to contribute to this horrible fiasco. 
Also, the country, day after day, got an update on the health of President Garfield. President Garfield's doctors, unfortunately, did not embrace germ theory, and they continued to use their fingers to probe his wound. The bullet was within him, and certainly after his death, it was shown that the initial shot where it was fired, um, he would have survived the bullet, but the continued probing of the wound, opening it up, um, led to sepsis, and that's what he died of, blood poisoning. Um, he rotted to death over the course of many, many months, a horrible way to die. but. The outcome was that Chester A. Arthur was now president. And the job he thought he always wanted, he had gotten in such a horrific manner, he no longer wanted. And he was willing, as a stalwart, to give that all up and any other political future he had to do what he believed was owed James Garfield and his family, which was end corruption. The Democratic Party. Um, had plenty of members in Congress at that time, although not a majority. But with those Republicans that were half-breeds, Chester A. Arthur worked with that group to form a coalition, and they drafted something called the Pendleton Act, which was passed in 1883. And it created what we have today, which is civil service. That position is come by test or credential. Um, obviously, government has grown tremendously in size, um, but the idea that every time you had a presidential election, you would essentially fire the bureaucracy and rehire it, um, not based on any expertise, but just political support, that begins to go away. By 1883, just in that first year, about 10% of all federal jobs um, become civil service positions. By 1900, more than half. And certainly today, those positions which aren't civil service typically are ones that require a credential of some kind, like having have a CPA so you can work for um, the IRS or having a law degree and being an accredited attorney in the United States. But those sorts of things will all contribute um, to what will become the end of patronage, regardless of which party wins the presidency. Patronage and political machines work hand in hand. So for someone like Boss Tweed in New York, he is an alderman, he's on the city council. He eventually wins um, a seat at the House of Representatives for the nation. But he was able to get lots of voters at a local level to vote for him and his cronies so they could run the city of New York as they chose. But uh, every time there was a national election, he also controlled that vote as well. If they were voting Democrat for Boss Tweed and his friends, they would be voting Democrat at the national level as well. But now there's no patronage. There's no way of kind of paying off people whose only interest in getting in voters was their own financial welfare or their own power that they could accumulate. So the Pendleton Civil Service Act did a lot to, to end the power of political machines, um, certainly in terms of infecting um, the national government. You're also seeing the beginnings of something called the social gospel movement, which we spoke about briefly when we were talking about Jacob Reese. Um, Jacob Reese's idea was that the local governments would come in and pass laws that would improve sanitation um, and the standard of living in cities. But there were other people like him who also said part of the reason cities were the way they were and that political machines had the power that they did was because there really weren't any social services and that even if it wasn't the national government or a local government, there needed to be charitable institutions that sought to improve the cities. Um, the social gospel comes from the idea that this was a Christian movement and that as Christian people, you gave money and your time in order to create spaces that could do good, especially for these immigrant populations coming into urban centers or just young people who did not have family and other support structures to be able to continue to live what was considered a Christian life um, with all the temptations of the city. The Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, is born out of this movement. 
And literally, a, back in the day, they were essentially apartments, you can see from our pictures here. Um, and as a young man, um, I could come to the YMCA for a few dollars a week. I could rent a room and access to a clean bathroom, and typically one meal a day, access to coffee in the morning before I went to work. They were focused on the idea of muscular Christianity. And so they believed by having a swimming pool, a gymnasium, people could work out. They created a sport to um, have, you know, good group interactions called basketball um, in the 1890s. But the YMCA will be instrumental in basically taking young men who might often have turned to vices like alcohol and prostitution and providing them at least some low cost place to live until they could accumulate enough money um, and become independent and a little more mature in the city. The Settlement House Movement by Jane Addams, um, what was known as Hull House because Mr. Hull had given her her first domicile that she could use in Chicago for this purpose. But you can see in the upper portion of my screen here, it was a residence um, that immigrants could come to on a daily basis. Um, it provided free childcare for working immigrants. It also provided English lessons. They would help um, immigrant families do the paperwork to enroll their children in public schooling. Um, they would also teach them how to best utilize um, their monies for the purchasing of food and perhaps help them with cooking um, because there might be access to different foods um, in the city than they had had um, from their country of origin. And then the last institution was called the Salvation Army. They still exist today. Um, and they saw themselves literally as an army against corruption and poverty and sin. And they spent much of their time attempting to help people in the most direct fashion possible. Um, so that could be access to clothing and food um, at times of um, war, like the Spanish-American War, World War I. Um, they provided um, some medical care and support for the the National Army. Um, they also, um, to this day, um, provide um, worship services, things like Alcoholics Anonymous support. Um, but their goal is to help those who have essentially nothing. Um, and all three of these will contribute um, to dislocating the power that political machines had over immigrants in the city. So as we end, um, let's practice our argumentation. Um, we wanna think about to what extent was government and private institutions able to reform politics during the late 19th century? If you compare what things were like with the spoil system and political machines prior to the mid 1880s, what changes in government and private philanthropy will ultimately create the beginnings of the reform era? that we will come to know as progressivism.